learn. And I will be your host for the data track. Uh, we have two other tracks running in parallel with two different other talks that are happening. So if you're curious about what those are, you could go to the agenda tab at the top of your screen and you can navigate to any of those talks. Before we jump into the sec uh, jump into the next session, uh, we do have a community question for you to weigh on. So if you could go to the poll tab at the right of your screen, uh, we'd just like to hear uh, your thoughts in terms of how you're using you know, data-centric AI in practice. We will make the results of the poll available in the Strong Pool booth uh, later after. And so if you could take a second to do that, we'd really appreciate it. Um, also, as we're going through this next talk, we will be taking live Q&A. So as you are listening, please take a moment to just answer, uh, enter your questions at the Q&A tab, also on the right of your screen, and, and I'll take those live at the end of the talk. And so with that, uh, super excited for the next talk. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage the head of AI and machine learning of commercial banking at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Daniel Wu. Thank you so much, Ardi, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Machine learning has become the state of our technique for many tasks, including computer vision and NLP. Even though more and more com components in an ML life cycle have been designed to run autopilot, it is beneficial to incorporate human knowledge into the NL system. In some use cases, this is even a necessity. Our discussion of data-centric AI would not be complete without discussing human the loop machine learning. After all, it was the desire of simulating human intelligence that inspired the field of AI. So human the loop machine learning describes the process when human is involved in developing, evaluating, and improving a machine learning solution through annotating data, designing algorithm, applying heuristics, and providing feedback. As illustrated in the bar chart here, human the loop machine learning is an active research topic that sees an increasing number of publications in the last 10 years. Human the loop machine learning is such a big topic with many open challenges. In this talk, I plan to cover a brief overview of human the loop machine learning and show two sophisticated examples of applying it to computer vision and NLP tasks. Before diving into human the loop machine learning, let's think about why it is beneficial or necessary to involve human and in the machine learning loop. First and foremost, we're all here because we recognize that data is centric to AI. Um, while AI is com competent at independently learning from large, high quality data sets, such data sets are rare in the business world and are very expensive to create. In fact, in a survey uh, done by Kaggle back in 2017, about 50% of data scientists complained that dirty data as the biggest challenge for their daily job. While we dream about working with a large data set of high quality, we most likely need to deal with the lack of quantity or quality in the data set that we have. Therefore, the most common application of human in the loop today is to augment rare and or low quality data with human annotations. Secondly, human intelligence is capable of many skill sets that are still unavailable to AIs at this time, such as creativity, imagination, understanding not just semantics, but also abstract meanings. Similar creative extrapolation is not possible for AI at this stage. Hence, human the loop enables this learning process and knowledge transfer from human intelligence to AI. AI applications can become black boxes in which the processing that converts data into a decision or insight is completely hidden. This is problematic for data sensitive activities such as finance and banking and for some decision making. Regulatory compliance and disclosure needs um, are associated with certain industries. So in these cases, human in the loop allows human to see how the AI tool arrives at a particular outcomes with a given set of data. For high stakes decision making, 
it is essential to have human the loop to comply with regulations and fulfill social responsibilities. When properly applied, human in the loop can really improve fairness, transparency, and accountability. In addition, humans' involvement in evaluation facilitates continuous improvement that leads to better consistency, accuracy, and robustness of the solution. As we'll see later in the two concrete examples, that when you properly apply and design human the loop, it can really greatly improve the efficiency and reliability of machine learning. Finally, an organization that can keep that can reap the benefits of human in the loop would have great competitive advantage stemming from all of the above that I just said, and also establish the trust that is needed for increasing AI adoption. So let's quickly look at some of the uh, real world um, human in the loop application in different fields. The most common use case that everybody is aware of when we talk about human in the loop is annotation. And this is the most known human in the loop application. And hence, I'm not going to go into details on this. In social media, um, human involvement is essential to help the machine learn to identify text, images, videos for hate speech, cyberbullying, explicit or harmful, harmful content, fake news, and so on and so forth. In healthcare, um, medical imaging and AI-based recognition of normal versus abnormal features of the image are being extensively developed. And such developments require intervention by subject matter experts to train the model to look for specific features of the image that point to abnormalities. Even the best trained models must be backed further by human confirmation because diagnosis and treatments deal with lives and mistakes are not acceptable. In transportation, we develop self-driving cars with massive amount of image, video, sensor data uh, that are collected and annotated by humans. Later, um, we'll also see a human in the loop application to video object detection that can be used to develop autonomous driving solutions. Beyond the above essential applications, human in the loop AI systems can have entertainment value as, as well. At Stanford, the Human Center AI Initiative, they design systems that combine technology with human interaction to develop new tools uh, to create musical and artistic contents. In finance, which is a highly regulated um, industry, human experts are needed to ensure the integrity of the automation process. Best of class AI solutions enable financial institutions to use combinations of machine learning and human review protocols. Human in the loop helps to ensure compliance with organizational and governmental requirements. Next, we'll take a quick look at where human can be involved in the machine learning um, life cycle. A typical machine learning life cycle goes through uh, these stages uh, involving collecting data, processing data, choose algorithms, find, um, train and two models, evaluate models, making inferences, and monitor the models. Integrating a priori knowledge into the learning framework is an effective way to deal with sparse data, as the learner does not need to induce the knowledge from the data set. It can be injected in the form of training data, dictionaries, vocabulary, taxonomies and rules, just to name a few. Recently, more and more practitioners integrate pre-training pre knowledge into their learning framework, which is also an effective form of integration of a priori knowledge. A common form of human the loop machine learning is to create a continuous feedback loop between human and machine. In supervised learning, which is still the most commonly applied machine learning paradigm today. Human in the loop can be applied throughout the stages of supervised learning from data collection, data cleansing, validation, standardization, um, and quality control. 
in semi-supervised learning with active learning is also a popular way of uh, applying human to loop uh, approach. Uh, one way to implement semi-supervised learning from unlabeled data set is to have humans label just as a, a small set of data to see the model, then apply the com high confidence predictions from an interim model or uh, use a transfer learning model uh, to label more data to auto labeling and then send the low confidence predictions for human review, which is active learning. In reinforcement learning, the agents learns from rewards it receives from its environment. And we all know that reward engineering is a very challenging task and um, it actually determines the success or the failure and how effective the agent can learn. Recently, Peter Beal and his group at Berkeley developed an interesting interactive deep reinforcement learning algorithm named Pebble. It empowers a human supervisor to directly teach an AI agent new skills without the usual extensive reward engineering or curriculum design efforts. Our second example uh, that we'll look at later will showcase humans' involvement in training an intelligent agent to perform semantic parsing in NLP through hierarchical reinforcement learning. So let's first look at um, an example of applying human the loop to computer vision. Applying human to loop requires a lot of thoughts and careful design for it to be cost effective. And in computer vision, uh, especially in video object detection and annotation, manually collecting object annotations is a very time consuming task. This becomes tedious, especially when the target size is small or the target is partially occluded in crowded scenes, which usually happens on, on the street scenes. So this particular work uh, proposed a simple yet efficient interactive self-annotation framework based on self-supervised learning to generate ground truth bounding boxes for video objects. This, their method can cut down both annotation time and human labor costs. The generated ground truth information can be used for various tasks related to video uh, object detections. So the proposed ISA framework consists of two uh, separate processes. Uh, both are recurrent annotation process. One is automatic recurrent annotation, and the second is interactive re recurrent annotation. Whereas the ARA uh, is a, the, the goal of ARA is to build a, an object detector that can support the IRA. And the IRA is the part that human gets looped in. So in ARA, um, we basically build a pipeline to iteratively train an object detector through self-supervised learning. And to begin with, they use off-the-shelf um, object detector and model uh, to begin the training loop and iteratively improve the performance of the, uh, the model. Once the model is trained, the model detector is improved through ARA, uh, the bounding box and the model itself would be used in the second phase, which is the interactive phase, um, where human annotators is involved in correcting the bounding boxes in a very efficient way. And mistakes are corrected to guide the detector, the object detector, um, to come up with better bounding boxes. They apply hierarchical corrections. So this is a very smart way of annotation. Instead of correcting frame by frame by the human annotators, they basically only, allow, only ask the human annotators to look at the keyframes, correcting those bounding boxes in the keyframes and then propagate the correction throughout the rest of the video. And through this, an important part of this framework is a um, labeling assistant. Um, I'll just quickly talk about uh, the design of this um, module. It involves three steps. Uh, this pipeline, first, it will have the raw detection by the model. Um, and then we filter out the low of uh, the bounding boxes or the objects with low confidence score. Um, after that, um, they apply tracking, object tracking by detection algorithms to 
uh, create tubulates. These are sequences of associated bounding boxes across the, the, the time of the video. And then they remove unstable tubulates. These are the uh, tubulates with temporal length less than five frames. And after that, uh, throughout this process, there may be objects that are accidentally removed or missed through the detection. So they have the final step of adding back uh, these objects or these bounding boxes um, in the previous and the, and the next frames. So a quick look at um, the, uh, the tool or the uh, labeling assistance. Here's these, uh, a sequence of three basically frames uh, in the video sequence. And from top to bottom, the top um, row shows the, um, the raw detection by the, uh, by the model. As you can see, it's very, very noisy and there's a lot of um, you know, low confidence uh, predictions, especially near the bottom of the frame, which is really not interesting or important uh, for, for our, our task. Um, and then the second row here shows across the time how uh, the low confidence score uh, bounding boxes with low confidence scores were removed uh, by the labeling assistant automatically. And finally, by applying the object uh, tracking, um, they were able to, um, you know, just just recreate um, or finding the mislabeled objects. Also, um, you know connecting um, the, the objects that should have been uh, labeled. For example, this in, in the middle here, um, right center of this frame, you notice that the object was, was accidentally removed, but then later add back. So this is a very powerful tool to automatically um, you know, create good uh, proposal bounding boxes before we involve humans um, to correct or um, the annotations that were done by the model. So quickly look at the, um, the evaluation. Um, they evaluate um, ARA and I, IRA independently. With, with ARA, um, they evaluate using the um, cityscapes data set. Uh, the observation is that um, with ARA, uh, which is the first phase uh, automatically founding, uh, training the model uh, to create high quality bounding boxes. They were able to, um, to see the, the detection results converge ju after just three iterations with good, good quality of bounding boxes. They also performed cross domain evaluation, um, you know, using the um, uh, baseline model pre trained on. Um, uh, Berkeley deep dry data set, um, then later try to adopt to a new domain, which is the cityscapes domain, um, using different uh, adaptation uh, me uh, methodology. And the result is that with this interactive approach uh, through ARA, actually outperforms all these other uh, approach, which is basically just train the model once um, or through uh, model adaptation approach. And the, the, the performance gain is actually pretty significant here, as you can see. With IRA evaluation, um, they look at uh, a different data set, um, which is the dash cam accident data set. Um, and um, what they found out is that uh, the entire ISA framework evol involving both ARA and IRA is nine times faster than the manual annotation. And that manual annotation basically means that you ask humans to annotate frame by frame all objects. Um, they also concluded that on average, running through the entire process takes about 19 seconds, um, whereas ARA takes about four seconds and IRA takes about 15 seconds, which makes sense because IRA involves human um, in the loop. ISA also requires the least amount of correction, as you can see at the bottom row here, um, by the human eventually. And they also observed that the benefit of the first phase automatic recurrent annotation um, compared to just use uh, with use apply IRA without the ARA 
uh, it is still 2 and 2.5 times faster, and it also reduced the corrected object ratio significantly. They've observed that the benefit of IRA is that if you apply the second phase, meaning human in the loop, I say it's three, still 3.9 times faster than just applying ARA. And it also reduced the ratio of corrective frames significantly. So all, overall, it, um, involving human in the loop with uh, this very careful design, with a combination of automation tools plus uh, involving human at the right time and just making the only necessary correction greatly improved the model performance as well as um, the um, uh, the the result um, and the human the amount it takes for a human annotation. Quickly moving on to the next example is applying human the loop to NLP task. This is a task uh, to perform interactive semantic parsing. Semantic parsing aims to map natural language to formal domain-specific meaning representations such as knowledge base or database queries, API calls, and general purpose call snippets. In this particular uh, example, we're looking at if-then recipes. And if-then recipes allow people to manage a variety of web services with physical devices and ultimate event-driven tasks. This work focused on recipes from IFTTT, which stands for if then it, if this then that, um, where whereas where a recipe has four components, which is trigger channel, function, action channel, and function. So to the right, there's an example. User can just provide a brief description of the task, which is create a link code, uh, link node on event node and on ever note uh, for my. Uh, like tweets, and that should be parsed into a recipe that has the four components. And this is an important step uh, towards uh, a more complex natural language programming task. Um, however, natural language description can be very noisy and ambiguous or lack enough information. Prior work usually focused on just doing the parsing in one turn. And here to the right at the bottom, we can see an example of a very vague description supplied by the user simply says, record to Evernote. However, the ground truth label still includes the trigger channel and trigger uh, function, which is basically missing from the user description. And the prior state of art one term model cannot accurately uh, predict or parse what the triggers are, and which is understandable because it's missing from the user description. So uh, the proposed approach is to apply uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning and involve human in the loop to uh, provide the necessary information for the agent to be able to parse uh, ambiguous description into a well-formed recipe. So the challenge here is when should the agent ask the user a question and the next challenge is how do we ask a minimum number of questions? After all, involving human is very expensive, and we also want to provide a good experience uh, for human, and so we want to minimize the interaction to the extent possible. So quickly look at the results uh, that get produced. Um, they try out two different agents with the uh, implemented through a uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning. And um, um, the agent on the left follow a fixed subtax order, which means there's no high level policy learning. And the agent on the right uh, follows a two level hierarchical policy. As you can see, uh, the agent on the right is the most efficient agent, which basically just focus on the missing information. Um, it identifies that the triggers are missing and it's asking only two questions to be able to achieve uh, to accurately parse the, um, uh, the very uh, vague uh, description into the ground truth label. Here's the high level design um, of, of the HRL uh, algorithm. Um, the high level policy predicts the subtask, which basically is one of those four uh, predictions to make. Uh, either is the trigger channel function or the action channel function. And it determines um, you know, which subtask to tackle first, whereas these 
lower level policy focused on predicting the subtask or decide to ask the user a question. So the experiment, experimentation setup, um, they use the data set. Uh, all the recipes are actually created by real users from IFTTT website. Um, interestingly, about almost 80, over 80% 80 of the descriptions are very vague. So that's um, the study they did was CI means that, that there's a very clear description provided. Um, and uh, VI12 or VI34 means that there's some uh, vagueness in the description. They uh, apply different approach, including the baseline approach, which is the latent attention model that we just talked about, which was state of the art uh, prior this, to this study. And then they created four other agents um, to, um, to simulate the interaction with human and um, produce evaluative results. Um, so very quickly, they implemented a user simulation module because uh, involving human in the actual interactive training progress is very costly. Um, they also evaluate, create, uh, evaluate the, all the different um, models or agents based on these metrics. Uh, C plus F accuracy means that all four components are properly predicted. Uh, whereas overall accuracy will allow for subtask. Uh, look into uh, some of the subtasks will be mispredicted. They also look at the number of questions on average asked of the human um, uh, labeler or um, annotator. So um, a quick summary on their evaluation. As we can see that all agents um, outperforms the previous state of art model, which is just do the prediction with one turn. Overall, the two HRL, uh, the bottom row here, the two HRL-based agents perform much better than non-interactive um, models. Um, and the, they, they tend to also handle the ambiguity be better, looking at to the right the last two columns with the VI3 slash four uh, sections of the data. Uh, clearly, the HRL um, agent is smarter in asking fewer questions and achieving better uh, accuracy in this parsing. So with that, uh, let's quickly look at some of the directions that you know human to loop AI uh, should start exploring. One is uh, it will be beneficial to start collecting and share more human feedback data sets for different tasks. So more researchers and practitioners then start uh, leveraging these data sets. And um, also explore more complex feedback um, mechanism rather than just very superficial judgment. Finally, uh, we need to apply human-centered um, and human-computer interaction design principles to um, human in the loop ML design. With that, I'll conclude the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was a fascinating talk about human in the loop learning for both image as well as NLP use cases. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. I was just about to ask if people do want answers to the questions that they just asked, how can they best reach you? Seems like uh, LinkedIn will be the best way to contact. That would be correct. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you again for, for this informative talk. Um, thank for, you. Our, uh, for our audience members, uh, if you could take a moment to go to the polls tab and uh, give your feedback in terms of what you thought of that session, we would really appreciate that. And with that, uh, you will be moved on to the next session uh, that will be wrapping short. That will be starting shortly. Uh, you're in the data track, and which uh, and, and there are two other tracks called the technique track and the applications track. Um, by default, you will be pushed into the data track. If you want to move to another one, click on agenda and then choose the session that you would like to attend. See you at the next one shortly.